Oh, wait. Oh, hello, everybody. Hi there. I wasn't expecting that we're live. I just literally received um, a message. Well, actually, I'm not absolutely sure if we're live both on Antelopes and uh, ICMP's pages. Let me just double check that with, with uh, my colleague. Okay. All right. So, so this is going to be okay. I'm going to wait for about 20 minutes and pretend that I'm not live yet. Um, because I'm still waiting for this to start on Antelope's channels. From what I understand, it's already running on ICMP's channels. Uh, and I'm just literally just waiting. Okay, they're saying about three, four minutes. Uh, so, well, I guess I can introduce myself, although that means that everyone will miss this part. Um, and we're meant to start in about five minutes. So, I don't know, perhaps I should just entertain you while I'm here and uh, doing nothing. Um, anyway, so let, let me jump in into... Uh, okay, so there's already 20 people watching, so I'm going to start, and uh, if the guys from Antelope have a little bit of a delay, they're just going to miss the very beginning. Hi there, hi, my name is Nick Georgiev, um, and uh, you know, today I'm going to speak about microphones, which is one of my very favorite topics. I must admit, it's one of my uh, favorite topics. And as an engineer myself, I am uh, more of a recording engineer than anything else. I mean, I've got some credits as a mixing and, and a mastering engineer, but really most of it is about uh, recording. And I was very lucky that in the past I had a chance to run some sessions where I could actually experiment a lot. So I know that a lot of my uh, colleagues uh, that work with professional musicians very often say that they literally have to set up and start the recording and they have no time for experimentation. And luckily, that's not the case with me. Uh, most of the recordings that I did uh, in the past, uh, specifically in the beginning, they were uh, classical music recordings. And I had the chance to actually, um, because the performers cared really a lot about the sound, I had the chance to actually go to some venues and do a lot of experiments uh, in these venues. And that way, compare, like, let's say, different types of microphones, different types of mic priest converters, different polar patterns, small large diaphragm mics, ribbon condenser mics, you know, just A, B them, uh, try different stereo recording techniques, and essentially just spend my time listening, 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 and, um, you know, basically gathering some uh, interesting information that uh, could help me to do my job a little bit better. So... I'm still haven't begun with the official uh, talk, you know. Uh, I'm basically just waiting for uh, the Antelope stream to to properly uh, start because I think that there's a delay on Facebook, uh, but it should happen very soon. Um, and so, yeah, basically, my idea is to share uh, all kinds of um, ideas and experiences uh, that, that you know that, that I gathered in the years and uh, hopefully this is going to help uh, all of you to become uh, better recording engineers uh, because I think that knowing your tools is actually essential. Um, so I, I, I assume that we're already live and so here's what we're going to do. Uh, let's share my screen and I'm going to jump into a quick introduction of myself. Uh, so if somebody misses that, that's not the end of the world. So there's just a few pictures here just for you guys to uh, get an idea of my background and the things that uh, I've been doing in the past year. So uh, as I said, I'm a recording engineer and I, I, I've done a lot of work in recording studio and these pictures here are only just to show you that you know, I've, I've worked in different studios um, particularly in London, uh, and I spent like about six and a half years uh, in this place where I had the chance to experiment also a lot, you know, book the studios for, uh, let's say, the whole weekend and just uh, set up a bunch of mics and test them all against each other. Um, but another thing that I'm well known for, and probably that's what I'm uh, known um better known for is location recording. And so I love working, um, you know, I love working in studios. There's great comfort and the facilities allow you to very quickly get a specific sound and focus on the music rather than uh, anything else. 
Uh, however, there's something really special about the sound of places such as this one. There was a cave uh, where I've done already about seven or eight recordings. Um, and uh, I usually like to choose these kind of spaces because I believe that the room is a really I individable part of the sound source that you're recording. And when you place, particularly, you know, these were drums and this this was actually from a piano session, this, this picture that you see right now. Um, you know, all these, uh, you know, these kind of instruments, you know, strings, pianos, drums, they really like these kind of spaces. So I experimented a lot in spaces like that and particularly recording a lot of classical music. And uh, I want to say right now that, you know, um, not everything that I've done is classical music, but classical music was a very important part of my uh, training as an engineer, you know, becoming a proper engineer. And I want to actually use classical music here as a sort of comparison, as a sort of um, a base uh, point where I can go back to you and refer to as a reference, if you wish, because... Um, when we talk about microphones, uh, you will see that there's different philosophies. Now, some of these philosophies, uh, and kind of the predominant philosophy really for a lot of microphones, particularly condenser and ribbon mics, is let's try to get them sound as natural as possible. Yeah, Let's try to make them sound like the sound source, which obviously is impossible, but uh, try to make these mics sound as close as possible to the sound source. And, you know, working in spaces like this uh, and trying to get that, you know, um, taught me a lot about microphones because there's this philosophy where you pick the cleanest possible, most accurate microphones. Uh, similarly here, I'm recording some sounds for uh, sound design uh, in a very similar way. You know, you want a microphone that it's as truthful to the sound source as possible. So in a way, I will use this idea as a reference in my head. And, you know, there's a lot of other really cool microphones, like, for example, I don't know, a vintage Neumann M49, which sounds absolutely lovely, but it's a very colored microphone. Let's say an AKJ C12. You know, these mics have uh, valves, transformers inside, and in you know, the vintage mics, so they, they expect you know, the normal that they will not sound as natural as possible. Um, another thing about myself is that I also work uh, with this company called Acoustica and I develop plugins for them. So this is actually the very first thing that uh, I did for them. Uh, that's a... Uh, you know, a channel strip with two equalizers and five compressed Actually, There's a newer version of that with three equalizers. Um, I took part in the creation of this one, but also just a little section of it. Uh, the bigger part of this one, which is a 24 channel console emulation. And, uh, you know, it's got a bunch of EQs, compressors. And what's interesting here is actually that uh, I happen to measure uh, all the mic preamps of all these consoles and see the differences. And I've actually have a very, um, you know, a lot of experience of uh, measuring these kind of devices and then running a sound sample through them and comparing it with another device. And that, you know, made me hear um, some very small nuances that a lot of people would say that they don't even exist. But, you know, if you can actually hear that, in a blind A, B test, and then these things more certainly exist. So that's just to give you an idea about my background and what are the kind of things that I do. So A, uh, studio recording engineer, B, location recording engineer with a lot of experience of recording classical music, but also quite a lot of really, you know, uh, creative, broken sounds, distorted sounds. So I don't stop there. And also plugin development, which I guess is you know, giving me the more uh, technical uh, side of my of, of me as an engineer. Uh, so that's a brief intro about myself. Now, before I begin with the with the lecture, I want to show you this and uh, feel free, you know, after the event to essentially pause that uh, and go through these materials. I don't know if there's a way for me to post a link to the PDF. Uh, but if there is a link, I will do. Uh, but anyway, you can always... Um, uh, you know, pause the video and check these links. So what I've got here, what I've got here is essentially uh, a bunch of AES papers that were presented at different conferences or conventions and um, some articles from uh, different, uh, different manufacturers, uh, microphone manufacturers. So this is kind of, 
the, the stuff that if you cover and, and you go through it, even if you didn't understand some of the things that I said, uh, will hopefully help you uh, to, to get deeper into these subjects. Now, one thing that I want to make clear is, okay, I have no right to show you the full uh, AES papers here. And, you know, I spoke with some of the guys, uh, you know, high profile people at the AES and asked if I can actually uh, use some of the graphs from these papers. And I will do so today uh, because a lot of these papers are not available. You can't just download them. Uh, you need to be an AES member and uh, student membership is actually very cheap. So uh, for student uh, members, all these papers are free to download. Uh, in any case, uh, they are quite technical, but if you want to get really deep into the technical aspects of microphones, I believe these are really good papers to start with. There's also a really interesting one by Neumann, uh, which is a pretty much a book, uh, which is called, like, you can see it here. And if you go to this website, you will be able to download it for free. But in any case, if some of this stuff is too difficult to follow when you read it, I will now break it down and uh, get to the basics of this stuff. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the scope of the talk today. So I'm going to first go through uh, some different designs, and I'm going to focus myself on uh, dynamic mics uh, being moving coil microphones, uh, what, which is what most people refer to when they speak about dynamic mics, uh, ribbon mics, and condenser mics. And there's lots of other mics out there, so I cannot basically cover everything uh, within the limited time that I've got uh, for this talk. So. For this reason, I'm going to stop my attention to only to these designs. This is not to say that there aren't really cool carbon mics or laser mics or uh, uh, piezo mics and all kinds of other mics. Uh, it's just that these are probably the most common, I'd say, studio uh, microphones. Uh, also, actually, they're pretty much these three types of what's used in live sound. Although, as we know, predominantly, uh, you know, if, particularly if you're more old school, uh, you will be using dynamic mics for live sound, or, or I guess if you have a limited budget. Um, but in any case, I'm going to talk about the, these three types of mics. And the way I would try to structure the talk is that if you are a beginner and you don't have a very technical background, I'm going to try to explain to you some basics. If you are more of an intermediate um, user, you know, an experienced engineer, but not super experienced, definitely this talk should help you a lot. And if you're a very experienced engineer, I will try um, to drop actually these kind of little uh, bonuses here and there, like some... Um, insights that I've gathered in the years that I think that are, well, I haven't seen them uh, much on websites or on YouTube, so I guess they're relatively unique. Um, so that's what I'm going to do. I'm first going to talk a little bit about how these different types of mics work. Then I'm going to talk about their polar patterns and then some specifics. And this is where I'm going to dive into a lot of like really geeky uh, small details. All right, awesome. So let's see how some of these mics work. Now, I'm going to start with what we usually call dynamic mics, but I believe a more accurate way to name them is a moving coil microphone. And this is something similar to, uh, like for example, you would all know the SM57. Uh, let me show you, I've got one here. Although this one is, um, in, you know, uh, doesn't have the grill on and the diaphragm. And so essentially the way this thing works is you've got this little diaphragm and I've got pictures of it, so I'm gonna show you some pictures. And that diaphragm goes inside a permanent magnet and then on top you've got the mesh, right? So this diaphragm essentially is the thing that, uh, together with the magnet here, is what creates the sound of a mic like that. So let me show you. Uh, a picture of that probably it will be a bit easier to see how that looks like so that's the same mic that I was just holding in my hand and you can see here's the diaphragm and below there is a permanent magnet and the diaphragm has a coil which is nothing but a wire really, literally this is just a copper wire coiled around the base of the diaphragm it's attached to the diaphragm and that is placed within this magnet. And now you see this groove, this is where the coil goes. And so how does that work? Well, 
we should say that, that moving coil microphones um, essentially work on the uh, because of electromagnetism. So what does that mean? Well, so I've got a little video here. Uh, this is from a, um, a little application that I use for teaching. And uh, there's lots of them, in fact. And if we go back to uh, the links uh, that I was showing, uh, it's essentially, if you go to this address here at fedcolorado.edu, you will find a lot of simulations like that. I wanted to run this live, but I've got some problems here with my computer. I hope there's no glitches. Uh, so far, my colleagues haven't reported any. But essentially, when I start running more programs, I start getting some glitches. So what I've done is I've done a screen capture of the app. And what do we have here? So here's a depiction of a magnet, and these lines around that are the magnetic field. And you can see that when you move the magnet, the compass reacts to that, right? I mean, planet Earth essentially is one giant magnet. That's why the compass works. Now, there's a very basic rule of electromagnetism, which says that if you've got a wire and you run some current through that wire, so there's electricity flowing through the wire, this is going to create a magnetic field. And if you change the direction of the current, you will change the direction of the magnetic field. Right, So this is really cool. Now, if I have an electrical wire such as this coil at the back of the microphone and a permanent magnet, what happens is that when I move the coil uh, within the magnetic field created by the permanent magnet, this is going to induce some current into the wire because you see the magnetic field is disturbing these little particles that are over there on the coil and because of the magnetic field, they're forced to move. And what's important to notice here, I'll play the video again somewhere towards the end of it. What's important to understand here is that the current is created when there is movement. And when the movement is uh, sort of the fastest, this is when there's going to be the highest disturbance, uh, you know, caused to these electrons. And therefore, you're going to generate uh, more of the signal. So with these kind of microphones, really, they generate the signal when the sound particles in air... Uh, sound particles, sorry, the, the air particles, when there's a sound produced within the medium that we usually listen into the air, um, essentially are at their highest velocity. So what does that mean? Well, if you think about, um, about sound, uh, well, we probably kind of know what sound is, but let's just get back to that. So uh, we've got some kind of mechanical disturbance, for example, let's say a hand clap, yeah? And that creates a disturbance in the pressure of the air. Air is elastic, much so like water, but, okay, it's a different medium. I don't want to compare them one to one, but if you think about it, an equivalent to that in water, uh, all the water waves behave slightly differently, but let's simplify things. Um, if I drop a uh, stone inside a pond, I'm going to create circular ripples, right? And what's going to happen with, with, with the air particles, they're going to start getting closer and further away. So they move back and forth like that, right? So sound really travels in two ways, either as, as pressure, uh, you know, the pressure wave, that disturbance in the air, or as the movement of these particles that are oscillating back and forth. So these mics will actually generate the most of, the, of their signal when the velocity of the particles is the highest. Another thing about uh, a microphone like that, and let me show you actually uh, another mic like this. So this is one other dynamic mic, which I quite like actually. It's a vintage uh, Sennheiser 241. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about this one a little bit later, a bit more. Um, but if you think about that, now let's have a look at this diaphragm again. So. The coil itself is made out of metal. Now, the diaphragm itself is also not the most, like, the thinnest possible one. So this thing will have a lot of mass. And the problem with dynamic mics is you will see that um, if you check the frequency response... So here's an example. Oh, wait, let me just switch on, share my screen. So here is an example of the frequency response curve of three... Uh, dynamic microphones. Now, one thing that you should notice right away is that all of them 
have a fall in the high frequency response. So, okay, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll take a step back in case you don't know what, what you're seeing there. So I apologize if you're experienced enough to understand very well what's on the screen. Uh, but when you look at this graph, you see this is 50 hertz, 100 hertz, 1000 hertz, 10 kilohertz, so low, mid, high frequencies. Well, you can think about that as an EQ curve. This is just like me applying an EQ to my sound source. That's what a microphone will do to your sound. And you know, every microphone will have a frequency response that it's never perfectly flat. Even in measurement microphones, if you're really pedantic and you do the measurement in a very uh, accurate way, you will see that it's never perfectly flat. So it will always introduce some change in the frequency response of the source. It always acts as an EQ. And you will see that things are not so simple, actually. So what you're seeing here is the so-called on-axis response. In other words, if I take the mic and I speak right into it, just I point it in my mouth and I talk into it. Well, this is what this EQ will be applied to. However, you will see later on, I'll talk about this, but when I speak on the side or the back of the mic, that EQ is not going to be the same. Yeah, that curve. Now, why am I showing you this? To start with, you see all of them lose some high frequencies and that is actually very true. I mean, actually most of them will also have a lack of low frequencies, like in the sub-range. Um, but you see this is a kick mic here, so that one actually can have pretty massive sub. Uh, I will get to uh, why is it that there's four curves here. Uh, rather than one as it's up here. So I'll get back to this. For now, just pay attention to the curves that are uh, solid. They're not dotted, made of dotted lines, uh, rather they're made of a solid line. And so we lose some top end. Well, that's normal. You know, a microphone diaphragm that is so heavy will not be able to react fast enough to high frequencies. And in fact, it's very common um, that... You could actually, uh, so, you know, j just to get back to, to the way a microphone like this works, you can think about it as sort of the reverse of, of, of the way a loudspeaker works. Well, a dynamic loudspeaker works because there's also condenser loudspeakers and so on, but let's not get into this. The most typical loudspeaker will be just one of those. Same thing goes for headphones. And perhaps some of you might have actually uh, used your headphones. I remember the very first recording that I did, I didn't have any money, I didn't have any gear. So the very first recording that I could ever do in my life uh, was with my headphones. And it sounded horrible, I was, I was quite happy. And the reason why that worked is because loudspeakers, let me play you this video again, are built in exactly the same way. Well, not exactly the same because they obviously have to be much bigger and they're meant to produce sound rather than capture sound. But, you know, they're built in a very similar way. And this is from a cool website that you can see up here. And you can see here's the coil of wire. Here's the permanent magnet. What happens here is actually the opposite. You know, what we do with the loudspeaker is that we run electricity that represents the sound signal, you know, my music, into this wire this coil and because you know i run current through that wire that creates a magnetic field which then causes um you know this coil to be either repelled or attracted by the permanent magnet around it yeah so you could actually uh so it works either way you could actually get uh a loudspeaker such as the cone of an ns10 which is the most common way to do this and put it in front of a kick drum and get a really nice sub sound out of that. Now, something like this. Now, the reason why I'm showing this, actually, let me see. I'll play an example now of a recording made with an NS10 loudspeaker. Uh, let's see if everything sounds all right. Uh, and there we go. There you go. So can you hear that there's only sub bass? There's no top end at all. So the reason why this is happening is because obviously this diaphragm here, the one on, for the loudspeaker, will be even heavier. And so the result of that is that we lose all the top end. And in a more subtle way, very similar thing happens to dynamic mics. Uh, they lose some of their top end. Now, a lot of people are going to tell you that dynamic mics are particularly good in handling high sound pressure level. And that is true. However, condenser 
uh, mics, and as we will see, ribbon mics can also be made uh, to actually handle pretty significant sound pressure levels. Now, let's have a look. So I'll, I'll get more into these uh, comparisons later on. I first want to go through the different designs and sort of briefly explain how these things work. So another type of microphone that I'm going to talk about is the ribbon microphone. So how does that work? Well, in a very similar way to the way a dynamic mic works. So what we've got here is we've got a permanent magnet, and this is from uh, AEA ribbon microphones. Uh, here's another picture from Royal Labs. This is the ribbon element that's, um, that you can find inside one of these R121 classic ribbon mics. They're awesome. Everybody knows how good these are on electric guitars. Um, and I think it's a probably a bit easier to see the construction here, so I'm going to keep this picture for now. So what do we have? We have this aluminum foil corrugated so that it can move. Um, it has a bit more um, well, slack to say, it, so it can move more. Uh, it has a high. Okay, let's let's put it more uh, said more technically. It has better excursion, um, and that is placed inside a permanent magnet. So these are magnets. In fact, very powerful neodymium magnets, I believe. Yeah, they should be neodymium. And so when the sound pressure causes this ribbon element to move back and forth, yeah, that the fact that this ribbon element, you know, the aluminum foil, is placed inside the magnetic field will induce some current onto the actual, actual strip here. And so there you go, there's immediately a difference here between a dynamic mic and a ribbon mic, well, sort of moving coil mic and a ribbon mic, because a lot of people will argue that the, a ribbon mic is also a dynamic mic. Uh, but between the first type and this type here, is that actually uh, with a moving coil mic, the sound, uh, well, the diaphragm moves, the coil is attract, uh, attached to the back of it, and essentially, uh, the sound does not sort of, the electrical sound does not travel through the actual diaphragm. Where here, the actual diaphragm, you know, the ribbon element, is where the sound is both picked up and created as electrical signal. But one really important feature here is that you've got no metal coil attached to the back of that ribbon element. So it means that this element can actually react in a more truthful way to transients. And again, this is something I'll, I'll, I'll go through all these... Uh, you know, design features, and then I'll get back to the comparisons, and I'll explain, I'll get back to this uh, point, because I think this is a very important point. Now, a lot of people will tell you that a ribbon microphone is quite a fragile microphone, and that's sort of true, particularly with all ribbon designs. They can be very fragile, so I wouldn't put an old uh, Coase 4038 in front of my kick drum, yeah? Uh, but a lot of the modern mics can actually do that. Yeah, so AEA, um, Audio Technica, uh, Royer, you know, and, and, and other brands, they create ribbon mics that actually you can use on things like snare drum, loud electric guitars, or bass guitar, or, or, or a kick drum. And what's important as well is that the material and the whole resonance of, of this element is going to be different, but I'll get to that. So... Ribbon microphones, very commonly referred to as such microphones that have a very smooth frequency response. So they will very commonly also have a bit of a row off in the top end. And quite often they will have a little boost in the low end, which we'll get to again later on uh, today. Get back to this point later on today. Uh, but you see, one, one, one thing that can be seen here immediately is that there, is, there are some irregularities in the mid-frequency range, but if we go back to the dynamic mics, you will see that actually these guys actually have more pronounced bumps in sort of the mid-frequency or the high mid-frequency range of their spectrum. So they have these little... EQ boosts in the mid frequencies or the high frequencies, yeah? And even a very, very good mm, dynamic microphone such as the Bayer M201, which is designed to be as clean as possible. And in fact, it's a rather small microphone. It means very accurate microphone. Uh, a lot of people com com 
confuse it for a condenser mic, it's a dynamic mic, uh, even that one will probably have some irregularities, like here we can see this towards the top end, so it, there is a way to design a dynamic mic that has a very flat frequency response, and it doesn't have any of these very audible mid-frequency boosts, but a lot of them have them, yeah, particularly the older models. And ribbons don't have that. So ribbons will have a more natural mid-frequency range, a lot more natural mid-frequency range. And some of them uh, can actually, you know, going back to this thing about ribbons that they're quite dark, uh, you know, here's two models from AEA, and you can see that we're losing quite a bit of mid and high frequencies with this model. And here you can see we're boosting lots of the low end, cutting lots of the top end. So there's about 10 dB of a difference between 20 hertz and 200 hertz. So actually this at 20 hertz is probably going to go like 20 dB. So there's a massive difference. And this mic will most certainly sound very dark, uh, which kind of matches uh, what a lot of people expect from a microphone like that. Um, one thing that I want to say that's all not also not always necessarily true, because for example, I mean I don't know I've used the SE Voodoo mics. These are also really good Voodoo uh, ribbon mics, and they're actually quite bright in the top end. They don't have that uh, dark top end. So generally speaking, dynamic mics they have this pronounced mid frequency peak. Um, they lack a bit of top end, usually they lack some low end, ribbon mics, quite the contrary, will have quite a bit of low end, usually, more so, a lot more so, a very natural mid frequency range, and then have a drop in the top end. And I'll get back to these uh, phenomena and try to explain them a little bit better. Now, a third type of microphone is a condenser or also known as a capacitor mic. And that's the kind of mic that I'm talking into right now at the moment. And uh, I can show you uh, what, what I'm showing you here. There's a picture. Uh, is what's inside one of these mics. Yeah. So if you look at it against the light, you will see the diaphragm inside. Now... What's about, what's about the diaphragm here? Well, the way this works, it, it does not work with electromagnetism. It actually works with static electricity. So it's a completely different operational principle uh, on condenser mics when compared to moving coil or ribbon mics. You know, they work with static electricity rather than electromagnetism and induction. And the way the diaphragm, so this is the diaphragm, the way this is constructed, uh, is essentially this is a capacitor. Now, I'm not going to go into lectures on electronics and what really a capacitor is, but I'm going to cover it very in a very, very basic form. Yeah. So essentially what it is, it's two conductive plates, so two plates that conduct electricity, something that is made of metal, for example, and then something in between these two plates that is made of a material that is not conductive. And in this case here is air. And in fact, you can see both plates. So this is the front plate, and it's actually so transparent that you can see the one at the back that is perforated and has these holes. And these two are separated by air. Now, what happens is, so this is another one of these simulations that I wanted to run, but I've done a screen capture of it. So here's the two plates of the microphone. If I charge one of them, and this is exactly one of the things that the phantom power does on a condenser mic, is to charge one of these plates. Um, essentially what happens is that this works as a battery. You know, there's a lot of electrons stored onto one of these plates that repel the electrons on the other side, uh, on the other diaphragm, and well, on, on, the, on the other plate. And essentially there is this electric field that is um, in place between the two plates. So this is the force created by these two, uh, well, by, by the excessive gathering of electrons on one plate compared to the other. And so essentially what happens, I'll play the video again, is that the, when you put the plates closer to each other, there is going to be more charge on these capacitor. Yeah, so the capacitance of the capacitor, so to speak, goes up. So this is a measurement of how much electrons can this you know, capacitor star charge on its plates. And essentially, the bigger the plate, the more uh, you, know, you can store, the closer they are 
the more it can store. So what that means is that if I have a construction like that, and one of the plates is constantly moving back and forth because it's moved by the changes in pressure in air, that is going to cause for that capacitor to change, uh, you know, the charge on it to increase or decrease, and that is what's going to create the audio signal. Yeah. Now, condenser mics. I'll just give you a, a few examples of condenser mics. Um, they generally, at least to me personally, a lot of people will argue that ribbon mics probably have more natural sound. But I think to me, condenser mics have the most natural sound of it all. Like sometimes a ribbon mic may be preferable and that's not impossible. Like I very often, well, not very often, but quite commonly would prefer, even for recording of classical music, a ribbon mic, especially where closed micing is concerned. Uh, but... You know, to me, condenser mics are the most accurate microphones from them all. So they will have a very extended frequency response range, and that depends on the size of the diaphragm. So the smaller the diaphragm is, the quicker it can move. Now, uh, a lot of people uh, here would say, well, it's probably the same thing as with dynamic mics. So if the diaphragm is bigger, it's heavier, you know, there's more mass to it. And uh, for that reason, we can't expect it to vibrate very quickly and capture very accurately high frequencies. Well, to my knowledge, at least, I may be wrong about this, but to my knowledge, that's actually not true. It's, so just to get into a bit more of a geeky detail, it's related to the resistance, or more accurately uh, put, the resistance of uh, the air between the two plates. I may be wrong about this, uh, but in any case, smaller diaphragm microphones like condenser mics like that will be more accurate. And, you know, example of small diaphragms are such as this Neumann, the Sennheiser, MKH-20, the DPA-4006. All of these are very good, very clean sounding condenser mics. And large diaphragm mics will be something like an 87 or 414. Okay, I'll get to that. Now let's have a look at some differences between large and small diaphragm mics. Now to illustrate this I'm going to start with an unusual example. So I told you that one of the things that I uh, do uh, as an engineer is to uh, build plugins but actually one thing that I didn't uh, show you guys is that I also actually let me maybe show you a bit of that uh, I know there's, there's some pictures here. So one thing that I do is I also create, uh, I'm working on my own convolution reverb at the moment. So I go to some crazy places and I record impulse responses in these places to create something similar, well, I hope much better, but similar to, let's say, Altiverb or Space Designer or Waves IR1, you know, a convolution reverb. And... The way you do this is, well, there's many ways to do this, but one way would be to go to a place like that, put a bunch of mics, um, and essentially use a gun and record a gunshot. And that is going to excite the space and will give me a different result depending on the space. So I'm going to play a sample out of first this space, which is a very funny one. Like it has this... Um, concave shape, it's made of concrete and metal, so there's a lot of crazy reflections going on. And then I have this large cave, and you can see that this, this here is actually a human, you can see the size of it. I mean, the walls are some like 40, 50, 60 meters, maybe even more, uh, you know, the ceiling itself and the walls apart from each other, maybe up to 100 meters. Uh, that's on the inside, that's again a human being there, and... This is also another place that I sampled. It's a forest where you would expect to have almost no reverberation, right? Now, let me quickly play some examples of that. Um, okay, I, I was just sent uh, a message here. What mic is it that I'm using at the moment? I'll get back to this. It's one of these. Um, it's, I have one of them here. It's an Antelope Duo modeling mic. And it's a special mic, so I'll get back to this. This one has five pin XLR, so it has, this is like two microphones, but I'll, I'll get back to this one, yeah? And I'll play some samples, I promise I'm starting to play some uh, audio examples in a second. So, let me finish with the technical stuff now. So, uh, I was talking about the different spaces and that a gunshot in these can sound completely different. Let me, let me play you an example of that. So, let's play the first one here. Oops, Reaper doesn't 
quite like me as it seems. Okay, that looks better. Let me see. So here's a gunshot, a recording of a gunshot in the first place. All right, so that's the one with the concrete and the metal ceiling. You can hear, I'm going to play it again. You can hear the very distinct echoes, the many echoes that you hear in there. Now, here is a sample of that large cave. And the forest. Ah, that's the same microphones and exactly the same gun. So everything's identical, it's just the spaces are different. And you could even look at the spectrograms and see, so the way sound is uh, displayed here is from left to right is time, from bottom to top is frequency, and the brighter it is, the more energy it is. So there we can see there's something going in the low frequencies here, quite a bit of energy in the mid frequencies, not so much in the top end. At the top end, the reverb is quite short. In the mid frequencies is quite long actually. And can you see these long resonances? This is what I talk about when I refer to resonances. So this is this that the, the space was giving me back. So it's almost like a guitar string, you know, you tune it to a specific frequency and there will be a resonance. Okay, this is a more complex system, but something like this will actually happen on a mic diaphragm. You can think about the mic diaphragm as a tiny little um, space, basically. And usually that is uh, a circular space, but it could be rectangular. There are some rectangular mic mics, particularly ribbon mics. Um, and this is the large cave. You see the, the distinct echoes, one, two, three. This is the slab back echo and the very smooth decay. And then the forest, well, it's all very smooth, yeah? Now, this, you could say, has no resonances. This, you could say, well, maybe there's some resonance you can figure out here. But this has some very clear resonances, yeah? Now, a mic diaphragm will behave in a very, very similar way. Now, of course, it's a very small uh, physical object. It's made of a different material. It's not like the way the sound will behave inside the room, you know, and there's air and blah, blah, blah. But you can kind of think about it in the same way. So if I could actually run a gunshot into uh, a microphone, yeah? If I could somehow magically, you know, get that gunshot sound onto the diaphragm of the mic and I measure it, um, I'm going to get uh, a measurement that looks like that. And this is like the explosion that starts. Then it's... The, the, so this is what happens is here the diaphragm goes all the way to the back from the pressure that goes to where it was. So it was like, you know, this is the microphone. And the diaphragm goes to the back, goes to where it was. And then this is the settle time of the diaphragm, where even though the sound source originally should have been just go up, then stop here and continue. By the way, this is not done with gunshots, but okay, it's done with uh, electrical sparks, usually. But okay. We, uh, I'm not going to complicate things too much. So, uh, essentially what happens is if the microphone was meant to move to the front and go to the back and stop, it doesn't do that. It continues to oscillate a little bit. It has inertia. It keeps going. There's this settling time. So you see, um, if this mic was absolutely perfect, and I gotta say this is one of the most perfect mics out there on the market. Um, you know, <laughs> okay, um, there is another, sorry, I'll just keep on receiving another qu uh, uh, questions from the audience. I'll, I'll, I'll get, get to this. Um, so this is, the, you know, the, if this microphone was like the most perfect one, literally what we need to see is just to jump in the level, then go back to the zero, and then nothing. Now, but the thing is, um, actually, all microphones will behave differently. So here I have some measurements as WAV files. And I'm not going to open them in the software, but if I compare the waveform, uh, these are from five different mics. And it's an electrical spark, so exactly the same source, which is a very short source. It sounds like a click. It's just like, yeah, like a little spark by, uh, well, it's made with supercapacitors or something like that. But So if this is how the original sound that I'm putting into the mic looks like, the waveform of it, this is how a real mic will react to it. 
So the result should be this. You see, these are the different individual samples in my recording, and then only one is above zero. Everything else is on minus infinity. There's no sound here, but there is sound here, a lot of sound. There is high amplitudes, yeah? Now, this is what one type of dynamic mic actually will do. This is another. So it's the same source, but the result is different. And there's another, and that's another, and that's another. So for those who are curious, I mean, these measurements are not perfect, but they are uh, conducted in exactly the same way for the different mics that I'm demonstrating here. So this is an MD41, a dynamic mic. This is an SM57, and that is a RE20. Uh, and that's actually a condenser mic, a C12. Now, you can see actually that the condenser mic is sort of slower than the dynamic mics, and it's meant to actually be quicker. Uh, remember what I said that, you know, the diaphragm can move faster, so this should really be a lot closer to the original. Uh, but I believe that actually the reason why it's lower here is because it's not just the diaphragm inside the microphone that is responsible for uh, the way... Uh, a microphone will react to a signal like that. It's actually uh, also the, the components inside the mic, such as transformers or valves or the actual active circuitry in it, could actually also have an impact on that behavior of a microphone. Now, if I look at this as a spectrogram, the same thing that I was looking at before. So this is the original sound. What do I have? All frequencies from 0 hertz to 20 kilohertz are going to be represented at equal amplitude and the sound is very short. However, all the real microphones don't look like that. So first of all, they'll have not perfect uh, frequency response. That thing here, which is the same as this measurement that I was showing here, it's called the Dirac, but okay. It's nothing, something, nothing, nothing, nothing. That, you know, is the shortest possible sound that I can produce on my computer at that sample rate, 44 kilohertz, specifically for this one. And it does not have any resonances. It has a perfect frequency response, perfectly flat. There's no EQ applied. Now, you can see here what different mics do. They have resonances. And these resonances will be different for the different models. And this is actually a very big part of what a microphone will sound like. Now, when you pick, let's get back to something. I'll, I'll come back to this slide. But when you look at the frequency response of a mic, you know, how are they usually depicted? So, for example, the ribbon mics that I was showing you here, yeah, it's literally just one line. Let's look at this 57 graph. It's literally one line, one line, one EQ. They're telling you how that mic sounds like, yeah? It's one EQ setting. Now, if I actually look at this, uh, the one that I was showing before, this is what's called a waterfall plot. This is from the absolutely excellent book by uh, my friend Mike Senior, uh, Mixing Secrets for the Small Studio. And this actually shows a waterfall plot of loudspeakers. But, you know, you could, in theory, do the same thing for uh, real rooms. You could do the same thing for microphones. And, you know, that first curve that I showed you, the one that was displayed for the SM57, is going to be this first one here, which is right in the beginning. But then with time, the frequency response of a loudspeaker will change and there will be resonances. And here you can see that the rather very expensive ATC loudspeaker, you know, has a very similar frequency response in the beginning to the Behringer. But then within the time domain, there is more resonance on the Behringer, which will color the sound, will add something to it. It's like adding a micro reverb to the sound that you're recording. Yeah. And it also affects the transients. Remember these fast changes in amplitude that I was showing you you know, so to speak, shooting with a gun inside of mic, you know, the, the spark gap thing. Well, the transient response of mics will be different and there will be different resonances. And so it's very common, you know, for microphone manufacturers to tell you what's the frequency response of a mic, but that does not necessarily tell you everything about the mic, yeah? Uh, so if we compare a typical small diaphragm condenser mic to a large diaphragm condenser mic, we, and we expose them to exactly the same 
bank, you know, that's spark, we will see these two different waveforms. Now, that's very important, yeah? So, if you want more details, obviously, you want to go for small diaphragm mics. But, okay, let me, let me expand more on that, yeah? Uh, so, I think this is pretty much the more technical side of the talk that I wanted to uh, cover. Now, I'm going to get into demonstrating some of these features. Um, before I move to that, I just want to say a few other things about large and small diaphragm mics. Um, so, generally speaking, because of physics, the smaller the diaphragm of a mic is, the more self-noise the microphone will have. So, all audio systems have some kind of uh, inherent self-noise. Like, think about my room here at the moment. Now, you don't hear it, but the back of my mic is pointing at my laptop. There's a lot of noise coming from that laptop. Yeah, the fan noise. So, there is noise inside my room as a sound system. Well, there will be some electrical noise generated um, inside the microphone, which is always there. And different designs will have different self-noise. So the smaller the microphone, the quicker it can move. And the more accurate it will be. It will give you more accurate sound. It's not through the large diaphragm mics are better. This is completely untrue. We prefer them for some reasons in many applications, but a small diaphragm mic is always more accurate than a large diaphragm mic. That is by definition. The problem with small diaphragm mics, though, is that they always have higher self-noise. So, if you are recording a quiet source, I don't know, a, a violin from five meters inside a church, and you pick a mic that is a very, very small diaphragm, that is going to give you a very realistic sound, but you may also hear a bit of shh inside the recording, and that's a problem. So, uh, I know a lot of sound designers who record all kinds of miniature, uh, like, sounds. You know, it's a microphone because it allows you to amplify sounds, like a microscope, except for sound, right? So, I have some friends who would record... Uh, I, I don't know if you've seen, there was a video on the internet of this guy who's a sound designer. He's put a metal plate and put, like, a centipede walking on the metal plate, and, you know, that... Um, person recorded essentially uh, the feet of the centipede, you know, making sounds on the metal plate. Well, for something like this, I'll go with a large diaphragm mic because that won't be noisy, yeah? And a very typical example would be uh, AKG C414, uh, TLM103 by Neumann. These are very, very quiet mics. Uh, now... Sound pressure levels, you know, if you're concerned about sound pressure levels, well, of course, picking a dynamic mic, dynamic mic or moving call mic, actually, more, more accurately, uh, is always a good bat because they can take a lot of SPL. You can put them inside a kick drum, uh, on a snare drum, whatever, they're fine. However, uh, it's not true that condenser mics cannot be made to handle this kind of SPL. They do. They can. Uh, it depends on the design. So, for instance, if you compare something like a U87 by Neumann with the TLM-170, again by Neumann, two large diaphragm mics, what will happen is that you will see that uh, the TLM can handle about 20 dB more SPL. Now, usually the reason for that is not so much the diaphragm, uh, that the diaphragm is overloading as it is the electrical components inside a condenser mic. Yeah. So if you design it with the idea to handle high SPL, condenser mics can handle the same amount of SPL. Or, well, I mean, kind of the same. You, uh, you can put a TLM-170 inside a kick drum. I've done it. A lot of people wouldn't. I've done it. It won't damage the mic. Yeah. Uh, don't do this with a ribbon mic, you know. Uh, go on either Royers or AES websites. They've got these methods on how do you actually uh, can you use a, a ribbon mic uh, on a kick drum so that you don't damage it. Another thing actually to mention here is the mic sensitivity. Uh, so I've seen that I have a question about uh, gunshots and balloons. I'm just going to go through the mic stuff and I'll get back to this one. And if there is interest, I can do another session on specifically on the reverbs and, and you know, the whole reverb sampling and gunshots and all of that. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about mic sensitivity because that is, I think, uh, a misunderstood um, concept about mics. Mic sensitivity literally means one thing. You got a mic. 
and you got let's say you got two mics two different mics yeah such as these two and you expose them to the sound the same sound one of them will generate higher voltage than the other that's all sensitivity is about now we can talk about what's the best methods to measure this and so on but that doesn't matter what you need to remember sensitivity is literally about how much voltage or how hot of a signal a mic will output when you compare it to another mic at the same you know with the same source exposed to the same source so uh these mics here for example they're small diaphragm condenser mics made by antelope the verges yeah and they have quite high self noise because they have very low sensitivity and the reason why these mics have low sensitivity is they've been designed to have low sensitivity so that you can actually use the, these up close uh, on a snare mic inside a kick drum right in front of the cone of a loud guitar amplifier and they will handle it yeah and the problem with that uh, of a mic like such as for example this one, which has much higher sensitivity, could be that, well, a, the internal electronics of the microphone could overload if you expose it to a very high sound source. But even if the microphone doesn't overload, it could be that it's outputting such a high signal that it can, dam um, it can uh, distort your mic pre. It's not going to damage anything, yeah? Uh, it, it can actually cause distortion in the mic pre. So... Here's a little hint. If you've got a mic that has a pad on it, don't use the pad because when you use the pad, you bring up the noise floor. But if you're overloading, it's much better to use the pad on the mic rather than use the pad on your mic pre because now you're avoiding the overloading inside the mic rather than the mic pre, which could be receiving a signal that has already been overloaded. And I hope that makes some sense. Okay. Now, another thing that I want to talk about is polar patterns, and this is where things start getting interesting. Okay, so what is a polar pattern? Now, if I take a mic such as the one that I'm talking into, yeah, this one that I hold in my hand, let's uh, think about this for a second. Now, this is the front of the mic where the logo is. This is where I'm meant to talk, yeah? Now, that mic could be made to pick the sound for either from everywhere, 360 degrees, or it could be made to um, sort of pick the sounds rather from the front, but not from the back, or maybe from the front and the back, but not from the sides. You know, something like that. And that's what polar patterns are about. And they're there to help us uh, to pick only the desired sound. So here I'm comparing three uh, of the most typical polar patterns. So that is an omnidirectional uh, polar pattern, the circle. Omni means picking up the sound from everywhere. Now, if you look at the microphone from the top, that's kind of what this circle in the middle of the image represents. And the, the arrow on the top shows the direction of the sound. So it's like kind of like, well, like this. And the sound is coming from there, right? So it's coming in the front of the mic. Now, an omni polar pattern should pick everything from all sides. A cardioid, looks like a heart, should pick everything from the front, but reject the sounds that are coming from the back. And a figure of eight polar pattern is the one in the red that should pick everything from the front and the back of the mic, but it should regre uh, reject, <laughs> regret, reject it from the sides. And... It looks like that. So if I take this, a figure of eight will pick it from here, will pick it from here, but it won't pick anything from around. Now, uh, let's actually jump into a demonstration of this idea. So here I'm going to show you uh, a play an example from a session I had together uh, with producer and engineer Cameron Craig. So, the first thing that I should do, uh, well, I'm going to play you a sample of the same antelope, um, antelope edge duo mic that I'm using also to talk into here, and that was used on the kick drum, and so... Cool thing about these mics, I'll get into how this works, but is that because it has two outputs, it's like having two mics 
uh, inside one microphone. I can then, uh, in the post-production process, essentially with a plugin, be able to change the polar pattern of the mic. You see that I can also change the mic model that it emulates, but I'll get to this later. So for now, we're talking about the polar pattern alone. So what do I want to show you here? Uh, I just wanted to, sorry, just one second. I want to give credits to, to Cameron and the band. And I think that I must have put the credits in the wrong place. So this is just literally one second. Oh yeah, there it is. These are the credits that I wanted to show. Uh, so the music that we're going to hear is by a band called Little Thief. The label's called Funnel Music. Producer, engineer Cameron Craig. Uh, we did this project together with him. Uh, by the way, I want to make a plug here. On Friday, we are going to talk with Cameron live again. That's this Friday at 5 o'clock UK time. Uh, 5 afternoon, yeah, 5 p.m. Uh, we will talk about vocal production and his work with uh, singers such as Bjork, um, Annie Lennox, uh, Grace Jones, and 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 others. And others. And that's not going to be a, a technical talk. It's going to be mostly about uh, recording, mixing, and production techniques. Yeah. Okay. Let's get to that example. Let's let's hear this kick mic. And the reason why I picked it is because. It's very telling. Like it, it, it really, it really, really, really shows how the polar pattern affects the sound. Okay, let me show you something here, and that is how everything was situated in the live room. So, uh, strong room studio one. I mean, uh, this is just a very rough uh, drawing of it, but we had the drums on one side. Then there is a guitar booth on the side, a vocal booth here, and there's something like a booth between the um, studio, the live room, and the control room, which is down here. And so we had the bass amp sort of on this side of the room, the drums on that side of the room. The edge do is pointing at the kick drum in this direction. So if we think about the polar patterns, if I use an omnidirectional polar pattern, I should pick all sounds from the room, like from everywhere. If I use a cardioid polar pattern, I should pick mostly the kick drum or the drums, because you see I'm rejecting the stuff at the back. I'm picking it up somewhat on the sides, kind of half of the reduction, and then I'm not reducing anything from the front. And a figure of eight will pick the drums and the back of the room, which means that both in Omni and figure of eight, I should be getting a lot of the bass and the drums. But in Omni, I should also get more of the reverb of the room. Yeah, let's have a listen to that, see how uh, good of an example this is. I think it's a very good example. So here's my plugin. Now, currently the mic is set to cardioid, but I can fully vary the polar pattern from figure of eight to cardioid to omni. So let's hear it in uh, cardioid, which is the way this was designed to, you know, was intended to be used. So we get just the kick, right? Now see what happens when I go to Omni. Can you hear the bass, the room? And if I go the other way, well, I've got the kick and the bass now, the back of the room. And what I can do is actually, I can still be in Cardioid, but here I've got another instance of the same microphone. Of, well, it's the same track that I duplicated in Reaper. And so essentially, if I switch between the two tracks, what I've done is I've swapped essentially the front and the back of the mic on the second one. So now I've selected Cardioid for both of these. Now what you're going to hear is the first one is aiming at the kick, where the second one is actually aiming at with the back of the mic at the kick, and the front of it is aiming at the room, and you hear it's a very different sound. See, a lot of the room and the bass, and the whole kit reflecting back from the sides of the walls. Focus on the kick, and that's the cardioid polar pattern. All right, so hopefully that was a decent illustration of what 
uh, the basic uh, stuff about polar patterns is about, yeah? Uh, and there is this uh, graph that you will find online that is pretty cool, that is telling you if you've got an omni mic at about one meter from the sound source, and you want to have the same amount of direct sound and reverberation picked up, uh, uh, if you select the cardioid mic, you can put it at about 1.7 meters. Yeah. So if I wanted to get the effect of, you know, having a blend of the direct and the reverberation sound, uh, in a similar way to what the Omni mic was doing there, I just have to put it in cardioid and move it back another 70 centimeters, if that makes sense. Yeah. So the different polar patterns will allow you to work at a different distance, but unfortunately, that's not the full story. Yeah. That's kind of basic, but it's not the full story. Now, the way the polar patterns are achieved can be done in one of a few ways. Well, one of, one of two ways, so to speak. So, let's have a look at that. Now, if I have a microphone such as this one here, now this is a cardioid uh, polar pattern. The way I know it is because of these uh, lobes on the side. Now, actually, if I put my hand around it, this will become an omnidirectional mic. So what I've done here is I have one version of it that has tape around it, around the ports, and the other one doesn't. Now, don't put tapes to turn your cardioid mic into an omni mic. Um, it's not going to sound well. This can be done, and there are some mics like this that do it. Uh, like, for instance, I don't know, the KSM, uh, the Shure KSM 141 or the Shurps MK5. Um, but if you've got a normal cardioid mic and you turn it into an Omni in this way, it's not going to sound amazing for some reasons. Um, now, but let's imagine this is an Omni mic. It didn't have the ports. That's why I've closed it. Yeah. And so literally that's the back of the mic. That's the front of the mic. Now, what is going on? There is sound created in the room. Yeah. That creates a change in the pressure. Now. The diaphragm's exposed on this side. The way the microphone works is very similar to a barometer. Really, this is what it is. What happens is that as soon as the pressure in the air is either higher or lower than the normal pressure. So imagine uh, that I'm inside my room and there is absolutely uh, nothing, no sound going on. Yeah. Uh, there is some uh, pressure in the room that it's kind of static. It's there. It's in a, you know the particles in equilibrium. I've got the atmospheric pressure. Now, as soon as there is a sound created, that will create a disturbance. It will create higher and lower zones of pressure. Yeah. So there will be compression rarefaction. Now, as soon as the diaphragm sees a change in the pressure, it will react to it, and it doesn't care. Is the pressure wave coming from this side, from that side, that side? It doesn't care. What it cares about is if there is a change in the pressure. Does it go higher or lower pressure? If it does, the diaphragm moves and it generates the signal. Yeah? It doesn't care what's the direction of the pressure. All right. So, uh, what is going to be the case if I have um, a different design? Now, imagine... So this here is a condenser mic, but imagine this is a ribbon mic, yeah? And it has a front and a back, yeah? And the diaphragm is literally where this line here is. Now, here's what's going to happen. In a ribbon mic, the diaphragm will be exposed both from the front and the back. Well, that's very different. That is very different because now, if I poke it on this side, you know, it will, the diaphragm move this way and will create an electrical signal that has a specific phase. Now, if I poke it on the other side in exactly the same way, it will create the same signal but opposite in phase. Now, if I have a sound that pushes on this side and exactly the same sound pushing on that side, so I'm sort of trying to poke it on each side, but, you know, they're kind of neutralizing each other that microphone will not output any signal because there's no difference. So we have two very different designs here. In one case, the omnidirectional mic, which works like a barometer, there are no ports to the back of the diaphragm. Only the front of it is exposed. That reacts only to pressure. It doesn't care where the pressure is coming from. 
This one, however, if the sound source is coming from this side, well, it will push the diaphragm in that direction. There will be a difference between the front and the back. Signal will be generated. It comes from that side, same thing happens. But if the sound comes right from the side of the mic, sound is coming right from the sound of the mic, it's like me trying to push the diaphragm both to the front and to the back at the same time, but that can't happen. There won't be any sound. So in other words, if I speak on the top, the bottom, or the sides of the mic, like that, if that were a ribbon mic, there will be absolutely no output. And these kind of mics, they have output only when there is a difference between the front and the back. And the greater the difference is, the higher the output of a mic like this is. Where the omnidirectional mic, it doesn't care what's at the back of the mic because that doesn't reach, I mean, the back of the diaphragm, because that doesn't reach the back of the, you know, the, the sound doesn't reach that. So, now, this is the basis of uh, a, um, a, what's called a single diaphragm uh, omnidirectional, a single diaphragm bidirectional mic. You know, omnidirectional, picking up the sound from everywhere, bidirectional, picking it from this and that side, but not from the, well, the front and the back, but not from the sides. Now, a few examples of something like that would be uh, in the condenser world. Here are a few examples. So these are actually, all of these mics are omni. Uh, now, uh, and actually that's not true. So the, the, this one here at the bottom right is a dynamic mic. All the others are condenser mics. Um, and so here's what we have actually. Top left, omnidirectional condenser mic. Top right, figure of eight omni, uh, condenser mic. And if I zoom in a little bit more, let me see if I can do this. Uh, you will see that this one is exposed on the front only, where this one is exposed on the sides. So the diaphragm here actually is not going to be like that, it's going to be like this. Yeah. Uh, then, and, and both of these mics are single diaphragm mics. There's one diaphragm there. Well, it's the front and a back plate of a, of, a, of, a, of a capacitor, but only the front is exposed to the sound. Uh, in this one here. Here is the front and the back that it's exposed. Again, a single diaphragm mic. Another omni mic, single diaphragm, only the front of it is exposed. Another two omnidirectional mics. This is a dynamic mic. So it's very common that dynamic mics are usually either uh, cardioid or hypercardioid or supercardioid. Yeah, one of these types usually. But I'm giving you here an example of an omnidirectional dynamic mic. And it's the same mic that I showed you before. It's this guy here. This guy was designed to be placed uh, on a necklace under, you know, uh, on the chest of a, of a radio presenter. And for that reason, it's omnidirectional. You know, it's meant to pick the sound from kind of like all directions. So we can get into details about that, but I think that we're kind of running out of time. So I want to speed up on some of these things. So this is a very good example. The MKH-20, the DPA, the Neumann, KM-183. These are very good examples of a single diaphragm omnidirectional mic. These are very good examples of, well, the first three, of bidirectional uh, single diaphragm designs. And these are all ribbon mics here. And what I'm showing you here is that ribbon mics have figure of eight polar pattern. Now, usually, you can actually design a cardioid, you can design um, an omnidirectional ribbon mic, but it's not really practical to do this. Sometimes there are exceptions, such as the Bayer M160, which is a hypercardioid um, ribbon mic. There's one by AEA, hypercardioid live sound mic, a ribbon mic that they've designed. But usually ribbon mics are going to be bidirectional. And they follow exactly this idea. You know, the front and the back of the mic are going to exp be exposed to the sound pressure. Now, Here's the funny part of that. So let's look at this for a second. Now, I told you that an omnidirectional mic doesn't care about where the sound's coming from. And it's represented by this circle. This arrow actually is the front of the mic. I'm sorry I didn't put it on the top as with the other graphs, but the following graphs are all going to be essentially following this logic. The front is on this side. So if I were to um, hold the mic, uh, it's like that, yeah? This is the front of the mic. Now, here's my omni element. That one is always in phase. It doesn't matter where the sound's coming from. The phase won't change. However, on the one that was exposed on the front and the back, 
Well, it does matter because if the sound's coming on this side, same si sound uh, from the back, you know, will be out of phase, right? Now, if I take these two mics and I combine them into a single mic, and you can do this, you can do it. You go one on top, the other on bottom, yeah? And you record both of these, a figure of eight and an omni. And if you could match them so that they output the same level signal, and then you mix them together. Well, plus with plus will make double plus. Minus with plus will make a zero. And the result of that will be a cardioid polar pattern. So when you mix an omni with a figure of eight, what you get is cardioid. The back cancels, the front is boosted. That's the idea of a cardioid mic, yeah? And indeed, this is how some old designs, I think Altex, uh, some Altex were made this way. Uh, nowadays, people don't really use this, but in theory, you could do it. And if you've got, say, your, uh, these two guys here, say these two mics, and you put them on top of each other, and you combine their outputs, you're going to get a cardioid, yeah? Even though this is only, this is figure of eight. Uh, going back to this whole thing, like following this logic can allow us to create any polar pattern. And indeed, this is how this plugin uh, that I demonstrated before in Reaper works. Yeah. Uh, essentially, it's a slightly different idea there, but if we mix the Omni element with a figure of eight, 50 50, we get a cardioid. However, if we mix 70% of the Omni, and 30% of the figure eight, we get what's called subcardioid. Uh, if I mix 25% of the Omni with 75% of the figure of eight, I get hypercardioid. So this way, by blending them together, I can actually get any polar pattern that I want. So that's pretty cool. Now, that's not always how things are done. Like with single diaphragm mics, the way this usually is done is with these ports that I was talking about earlier. So this is the Neumann KM 183 Omni mic. This is a cardioid mic, 184, 185. I think it's a hypercardioid or super. No, I think super or hyper. I can't remember. I think it's hyper. And you see, this one doesn't have any ports, but these two, the directional one, have ports. Now, what happens is that when the sound on this cardioid model comes from, is, is, is designed in such a way that this is an acoustic labyrinth. It provides a delay for the sound that comes into the mic. Now, what happens is that when the, the sound comes from the front, the stuff that comes through these ports and directly hitting the diaphragm will be in phase. Just when it comes from the back, the stuff that comes hits directly the this and comes through the ports will be out of phase. And that way, you create a cardioid polar pattern. Yeah? So it's not like mixing two mics together, but it's with these uh, ports at the back of the mic. Now, if I take two of these cardioid mics, I imagine that I take two of these capsules, yeah, and I put them back to back. So one pointing this direction, the other one pointing in that direction. I will get into the way most of these things work and the way my microphone here, the one that I'm talking into works. What this mic really does is two cardioid mics. So one of them points in this direction, the other one points in that direction. If I sum the two cardioid outputs together, I get Omni because this one's picking the sound from this side, that one's picking the sound from that side, combine them together, they're picking the sound from everywhere. If I invert the phase and I do the same thing, yeah, I will get a figure of eight because now I get the positive phase on that side, the negative phase on that side, and the sides are canceled from the two cardioid elements. And this way I can create any polar pattern. And this is essentially how this is done in most microphones. So not all microphones are single diaphragm mics. A lot of them would be just like this one, the Edge Duo here, which is a dual diaphragm mic. And this allows us uh, to create these different polar patterns by simply blending the two outputs. On most mics, such as, let's say, um, Let's give some, some examples like C414, uh, Neumann U87, U67, U47, uh, TLM170. Yeah? Uh, the, all of these mics, they will be achieving uh, their different polar patterns by using two back-to-back -back cardioids. 
So these are dual diaphragm mics opposed to the single diaphragm mics. And there is a very important difference here. You will see, I'll get to this. So this is the very last part of, the, of today's talk where I'm going to get into really geeky stuff for those of you who are more experienced. So the last element that I want to cover before I get into this, and here's where we're going to play a lot of audio examples, is on proximity effect. And I want to talk a little bit about proximity effects, uh, effect. So what is proximity effect? Well, a proximity effect is that um, effect that when I speak very close to the microphone, my voice is very bassy. Yeah. But when I go back, like here, you will hear, of course, more of the reverb of the room, but you will also not hear so much bass. So, in other words, the proximity effect is that thing that causes um, a directional mic. It does not happen in omnidirectional mics, but in directional mic, is that thing that will cause the sound to get bassier when you speak or you record something from a close distance. And, but it works also in reverse. When you're far away from the source, you start losing low end. So the low end is either boosted or, 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 or cut, depending on how far from the sound source you are. Now, that's the basic explanation of proximity effect. Why does it happen? A lot of people won't tell you that. Now, I want to try to explain you very briefly why the proximity ha effect happens. Now, imagine my example, uh, rem uh, remember when I was talking about the pond and there's no wind, there's no waves, there's no nothing, the water is still, and I just drop a stone in the pond. That creates ripples and waves around where I dropped the stone. Imagine what you see in here is these waves, you know, these ripples. Now, the flat line would be the diaphragm of the mic. Now, if that's an Omni mic, it doesn't really care how far from the source is. It can be very far, it can be very close. It reacts to the pressure. Is there high pressure, low pressure? Diaphragm reacts, the output signal is there, it doesn't care. However, if we get to that um, single diaphragm figure of 8 mic, imagine that I put a ribbon mic on a kick drum, and I have three scenarios that is very close, somewhere midway and very far. Each one of these will sound very different. The one that's very close will probably sound larger than life, bassier than it is. The one that is kind of in the middle is probably going to sound natural, and the one that is quite far will probably sound quite thin. It will have no low end, or not much low end. And here's what happens. Now imagine these ripples, that they're circular. And the f bigger the circle is, the more it appears like a straight line from the perspective of the diaphragm of the mic. Now, when the mic is very close, and this is for low frequencies, obviously for high frequencies, these ripples will be very small, so this won't take an effect. But at low frequencies, where these are quite large, uh, when I'm close to the source, the diaphragm will see a lot of difference between the front and the back. The further away I go, because that ripple becomes more like a straight line because of its size when compared to the size of the, of the diaphragm that picks up the sound, then all of a sudden I find myself in a situation where there is no difference. And I don't pick any sound. Well, I pick it, but at a very attenuated level. Yeah, this is why the proximity effect happens. Uh, this, oops, I have forgotten to credit the author, but it's up here. This is from the PDF that I showed you. This is by Michael Schneider. And this is a measurement of one of their Neumann mics. And they've done it in an echoic chamber. And what they're doing here is look at for now just the blue measurement. Yeah, this is the on axis response. The, the, how the mic behaves right at the front of it, yeah? And see, this is a loudspeaker. That's a mic, yeah? Now, we can have the mic quite close, midway, or very far. And here's what happens to the low end. When it's very close, yeah, 0 0.05 millimeters, so it's like touching the speaker, yeah? Uh, I believe this is not exactly a loudspeaker, but okay, it doesn't really matter. The point is, look at the low end. It's so boosted. It's like, what, 12 dB higher at like 40 hertz? Where well, it's quite flat when it's sort of normal distance. And, you know, further away, it starts to lose some of that low end. So that's kind of like briefly what proximity effect is about, but there's a lot more to it. So 
Now, what you should know is that different mics uh, exhibit different amounts of proximity effects. Now, let me actually, I'll, I'll get back to this slide. Go back to this one here where we were talking about different uh, polar patterns. Now, here's what happens. The Omni mic does not exhibit any proximity effect. The figure of eight mic exhibits the full proximity effect. The cardioid mic is going to be halfway. So, an Omni mic, close, further away, no difference. The low end remains always as it is. Cardioid mic, it will be a little exaggerated when it's close, it will be thinner when it's far. Figure of eight mark, it will be very, uh, mic, it will be very thin when I put it far. It will sound very thick with a massive low end when I put it very close to the source. And any one of these polar patterns will behave differently depending on how close it is to the figure of eight or the omni. Closer it is to the omni, the less proximity effect. But it's not just that. Now, we need to, let's start digging into some interesting examples here. Uh, for example, AEA have enough, uh, a nice article that's uh, it's on, it's in the PDF that I displayed at the beginning of the talk. I'll put it again up uh, at the very end. Um, where they talk about the fact that they designed their ribbon mics with the idea that they're made for different distances. And this is very important because you can have three figure of eight mics that are all ribbon, but then they will have a different amount of proximity effect. They will be equalized differently. So a mic such as this one here at the bottom, the R88, will have a massive low-end boost. Yeah? And a mic that is designed to be used quite close will actually have that low-end attenuated. Yeah? So remember, figure of eight, ribbon mics, all of them are fig well, most of them are figure of eight, very strong proximity effect. If you pick the one that is made to work at a distance and you put it very close to a vocal, well, what can happen is that everything will just sound like low end, yeah? And you don't want that. You know, it sounds, all of a sudden, sounds so massive in the low end. There's so much pops and, you know, a lot of problems, yeah? Uh, and it sounds really bassy, and you can't even mix that voice. It's so bassy. You put it on a kick drum, it could sound cool, but it could sound very, very fat. And it could be like too much. So knowing what's the distance that your mic's intended to be used at is very important. And I'll get to this, but I think a lot of people uh, make mistakes when they say, oh, condenser mics have more spill than dynamic mics. Mm, I'm not completely sure about that, actually, and I'll, I'll get to this. I think that it's more about the fact that usually condenser mics are designed to be used at a greater distance, and therefore they have a bigger low end, and therefore the low end spill will be more on a condenser mic compared to a dynamic mic. So let's have a listen to some examples of that. Let's have a listen to some, let's hear again the kick sample that I played you, and then I'm going to go through some others. And now this time I want you to listen to is not uh, so much, am I picking the bass guitar of this recording, or am I picking uh, the room sound as much as what is going on with the low end? Am I getting more or less low end when I go from Omni to Cardioid or, uh, you know, figure of eight? Okay, so the low end actually starting to become less on the figure of eight. Yeah. That's because I'm quite far from the source in this case. Well, not really far, but relatively far. Uh, I want to play you another example, maybe something that is a lot more obvious. Uh, but before this, actually, let me demonstrate you something really cool here with this kick mic. So... Uh, what I said here is that some mics will be designed to work quite, to be used quite close and some will be designed to be used quite far. So here's what's going to happen. I'm going to put this mic on figure of eight and then I'm going to switch the model to a ribbon model. And you will hear, I guess, quite a significant difference, I think. So let's, let's listen to that. Figure of eight condenser mic, the original mic that we used. No emulation.
So what's going on? Less low end, more top end. Massive low end, top end's quite attenuated. Well, remember the ribbon mics? They lose some of the top end. Remember the proximity effect? Well, these ones were made to be used at a closer distance. Uh, sorry, the, uh, at, at a further distance, far away. And I believe this is why people like so much the cause. Um, mics because, you know, the 4038 model, because uh, when you're quite far uh, from the source, that still retains the low end. When I will never forget uh, when I used for the first time the absolutely excellent uh, Shops MK8, which is a figure of eight mic, single diaphragm, small diaphragm condenser. To my experience, these are the ones that have the thinnest sounds. Yeah. They have very thin sound. So I used it uh, in figure of eight at a distance from the sound source. I remember it was actually violin and, and a cello. And it sounded horrible. And I moved it quite close and all of a sudden it sounded nice because, you know what, that mic is designed to sound flat at a closer distance compared to the 4038, which you can put back in the room. And this is where it will sound more flat. Now, if you could put it in front of a kick drum, uh, you're going to get a massive low end boost. I wouldn't recommend this uh, with this specific mic here. We can do it because it's an emulation, yeah? So uh, the proximity effect, in other words, it's different for all these different mics. It's never, never the same. And in fact, these graphs that I showed you, each one of them must state at what distance is this measurement performed? Because if it's at a very close distance, uh, and the other one is at the, you know, it's, let's say one is at half meter, the other one is at one meter, the other one is at two meters. How can I compare these graphs? I can't, you know. So ultimately, of course, always you should use your ears uh, to, you know, to essentially uh, get the difference. Now, here I want to play you another sample. Same mics on overheads. And this is from a different session. Uh, this one was at Oregon Studios. Uh, let me show you some quick pictures of that. So this was at Oregon Studio with uh, producer Jaime, uh, Jaime Gomez and uh, drummer Walt from Paradise Lost. And I want to show you, so here is the overheads. And I've got two of these mics, and what we're we gonna do now, we're gonna listen to them uh, at different polar patterns. Yeah, and we see how the proximity effect and the spill changes uh, drastically. And just so you can see kind of the size of the room, it's a very nice, uh, rather large, uh, maybe you can see a bit more of the room here, but it's a rather large room, it's quite nice. So, Let's hear that, and I'm going to put up the plugins for the two mics. And so I've got left and right mics here, and here's how they sound in Cardioid. Omni. I ah, listen to that low end. Again, because the overheads were quite far, when I go to Cardioid, I start losing the low end. And if I go to figure of eight, I will have almost no low end. Let's have a listen to the comparison between figure of eight and Omni. A lot more low end, right? But also I get more of the room. Also notice, When I go to Cardioid, how actually mostly the skin sound, the top skin of the toms, and you know, is, is what's really audible and the snare, yeah? When I go for Omni, I kind of hear the whole drum kit, you know, all these reflections of the drum kit around the room getting into the mics. Let, let's hear this one more time and I'll play some other examples.
Now, another thing that you can notice here is that actually when I go to Cardiate, uh, things become more... Oops, I just realized I wasn't sharing my screen to show you, uh, but, but you were hearing it. So, you know, Omni, like that. Figure of it like that. Um, uh, I, I don't know if you could notice this as well, but, you know, there was more definition in the stereo picture when I went for a more directional polar pattern. Uh, because, you know, the mic can focus and create a greater difference between the left and the right channels. Yeah, that's that's really what happens here. Okay, let's see something else. Now, I'm going to play you something really cool. This is my favorite example uh, from all of them. It's really, really nice. Um, so, this is from a different session. And this is where you will actually understand a little bit better the difference uh, that I was talking about. Uh, and, and, and actually, I think this, this example will help a lot to understand better the polar patterns, Yeah, the idea of the polar patterns. Um, so that is from a session at the Ferrari Studios. Uh, and here's some credits. Uh, so Jerry Brown, an amazing drummer, and the Ferrari Studios, good friends of mine, I have an amazing studio outside London, and you can see here the session, essentially. So that's a drum kit again, and uh, you can see it inside the room. Not a massive room, but really nice drum kit, um, an amazing drummer. And again, uh, I'm going to play an example of the Edge Duo. And what am I going to play you? I'm going to play you this mic. Why would I want to play this mic? Why would I want to put a mic there? Well, let's have a look at another picture of it. See now where this mic is. Now, the mic is right in the middle of the snare drum, pointing down at the kick drum. And the side of the mic is looking at the shell of the snare. Now, you probably think that I'm using this microphone in Omni uh, because that will give me the whole drum kit. And that's quite true. You'll hear this in a second. Another thing is uh, that I could put it in cardio. If I put it in cardio and I point it down, it will be a kick mic. If I point it up, it will be a snare top mic. However, if I put it in figure of eight, now remember the figure of eight, this side is in phase compared to the sound that comes from that side, which will be out of phase. So they're wired electrically out of phase, the front and the back of the diaphragm. Now, the snare top will diffract around, you know, the sound from here, and will get into this side of the mic. The bottom, similarly, will do the same we got on that side. Now, however, the sound that is produced by the top and the bottom skin is also out of phase because, you know, if these are the two skins, you know, like when this one moves down, uh, kind of, well, when I sort of, if this produces this kind of phase, this is going to produce the opposite phase if the mics are pointing like that, if you think, if, if you think about it, right? The, the, the typical thing where you flip the phase on your snare mics. So... If the snare is already out of phase and the mic is also out of phase, what that means is that actually the snare top and the snare bottom will be summed perfectly into the figure of eight mic. Because the figure of eight mic has a very strong proximity effect and is so close to the kick drum, I will get a massive low end boost and that will disappear in Omni. Yeah? So let's have a look, let's have a listen rather uh, at this example my favorite by all means. So I should say that all of these examples that I'm playing have absolutely no processing. So let's, let's start in Cardiot. So this in Cardiot is going to be a kick mic pointing down. Well, actually, this is a snare mic, it's pointing up. Yeah. Now if I put it in Omni, yeah, let's have a little loop. The kick disappears, right? But now check what happens in figure of eight. Wow, listen to that low end. Yeah, this section here. No, 
know if you go to Omni. It's a completely different sound. I get also more... Um, I kind of lose the, the thickness of the snare here. But you see the kick sounds very flat. And now, listen to what will happen if I change it from this figure of F-Mic to 4038. Yeah, let's have a listen to that. Or maybe one to one. Isn't that low end? Okay, can you see how now they, the, the ribbons have stronger proximity effect compared to the condenser? This is what I was talking about before that. Um, okay, I can see that uh, we're kind of running out of time. Uh, so I need to leave some time for questions. I wanted to play some other examples, actually. Uh, and I've got a few other things that I wanted to say. Um, Okay, so I'll be very quick with this stuff because otherwise, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, this can last for three hours. If you see mics with these kind of ports, yeah, that means that this is affecting the proximity effect, but it's reducing it. That's the idea. So longer mics with a lot of ports, well, they could either be very directional, like shotgun mics or something like that, usually affects the uh, proximity effect and minimizes it. Yeah. Uh, and let's jump into some more of the more of the geeky stuff. Yeah. So remember when I was talking about single and dual diaphragm mics? Uh, I want to show you something here. So this is from a paper. Uh, again, it's linked to the PDF. Sorry, I've forgotten. I oh, know. Uh, no, yeah, I haven't. I haven't credited this one. I should have. This is from an AES paper made by Sure. Very, very interesting. So I want to touch on that because a lot of people say, uh, you know what, uh, dynamic mics for live sound, that's the thing. And condenser mics, nah, that's too much bleed. There's too much, uh, you know, feedback. Uh, and, and, you know, that's not necessarily true. Now, here's what happens in my opinion. First of all, dynamic mic, yes, yes, it does not pick the top and so much. So let's say you have a mic on the snare, the hat is going to be, the top end of the hat is going to be quieter uh, in a dynamic mic than a condenser mic simply because the condenser won't pick it up so well. Uh, sorry, the condenser will pick it much better, actually. The dynamic won't pick it so well. Uh, but there is a much more important part here that a lot of people are, have missed. And this is about condenser mics. And actually, this is, this is a measure that I only recently discovered. And I was like, oh, wow, okay, this is very interesting. So these are two cardioid mics. One is a small, uh, is a single diaphragm. The other one is a dual diaphragm. So remember, one is only one diaphragm. The other one is back-to-back -back cardioid, such as the edge duo here. Now, they are usually designed to be used at, at, at different distances. Usually single diaphragm mics, not absolutely always, but usually single diaphragm mics, small diaphragm mics. Dual diaphragm mics are not always, but usually large diaphragm mics. Now, if you think about it, now, it's a cardioid mic. Look at this. So these are three different distances. Here... At the bottom, I have a very, very close distant measurement. And the polar pattern measurement, the actual polar pattern measurement of a mic, like that, two mics. Single dual diaphragm. Left is single, right is dual. Now, see, this is at six inches. What is this telling me? That at 100 hertz, actually, this, the single diaphragm is going to be not a cardioid mic at all when it's very close to the source, and even at one kilohertz, it won't be a perfect cardioid. Yeah? But, if I push it further back to about six, what is it, eight feet, it becomes a really, really good cardioid mic, with a very good rejection at the back, both at the high and the low frequencies. The dual diaphragm one, it does not behave like that. Not quite the same. That one, is a better cardioid when it's quite close to the sound source, 
but it's actually worse cardi when it's further away. So what this is telling me right away there is that if I'm concerned with a proper closed miking, I probably, uh, and I want to go for a condenser mic, I probably want to go for a dual diaphragm mic, such as a 414, 87, Edge Duo. If I am actually going for closed miking and I want a perfect cardioid polar pattern, I usually will, um, uh, so, well, I, I would usually put that back in the room. Now, to all of that, you should also consider the different amount of proximity effect. Uh, I remember when I was mixing classical music, mostly my EQs would be low shelves to either cut or boost the low end to compensate for the proximity effect and high shelves to boost the top end, uh, which in some cases could be lost. So. I know I'm running really, really over the whole thing, but I've prepared these materials and I'm just going to go through. Um, this is both to, uh, you know, the guys from ICMP and Antelope. If you think that I should call it a day right away, just text me. Um, but I see no messages from them, so they're probably not so angry at me. Now, another thing that you should always consider, is very important, is the high-frequency response of the microphone off-axis. So when we talk about polar patterns, you should always, 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 always think about how does that mic behave in the 3D, not just on the front of the mic. Now, most mics, uh, well, are not going to have perfect polar patterns. So... Generally speaking, figure of eight mics have the best uh, uniformity. Now, what happens is that omni mics will lose high frequencies either at the back of the mic. So if we have a design similar to this one, we will lose uh, high frequencies. Just let me find the mics. So if we have something like this, yeah, or like that, like a dual diaphragm, this mic will lose high frequencies from the side. So if, if I put it in Omni, it will be perfect Omni in the low end, but not in the top end. In the top end, it will be something like figure of eight. A mic like that, a single diaphragm mic, if this were an Omni mic, yeah, imagine this is an Omni, will not have the same effect. It will lose high frequencies at the back, not from the sides. I mean, it's quite logical that where this bit is, you're gonna lose some top end, right? It's an obstacle. You know, the diaphragm itself is an obstacle for the high frequencies. And so that is quite important if you are using the mics quite up close. And it's, let's say you're fighting the spill of your hat, yeah, of your hi-hat. Now, let me show you some, uh, some diaphragms here of these kind of mics. So an 87, yeah, here's it in Omni. Now, can you see that it's only in the low frequencies up to one kilohertz, but then when you go to 16 kilohertz, it becomes like a figure of eight. Yeah, by the way, all these measurements, I, I guess you know this, but you know, they, they're basically, what's on this side can be mirrored on that side and vice versa. They just use one single circle to, you know, display half of the frequencies on one side, the other half on the other side. But really, an, a U87 and a mic like the one that I'm talking into will be more like a figure of eight mic uh, in high frequencies, where if I look at a small diaphragm mic, such as the Schoeps MK5, that will lose quite a lot of high frequencies at the back. Yeah, not, It will lose some on the side, but not so much as at the back. Now, this is very important because uh, it could affect your spill. You know, it could affect your hot spill if you're mic in the tom and the, the, the loss is on the side. You know, this, this mic will have more top end on the side compared to an 87, which will reject more of the top end of your hi-hat spill. Uh, but also, you know, when you do stereo, these are really important things. Now, here I have one example. Uh, I want to play very quickly just to illustrate how drastic this difference is. And this is a... Uh, a sample of me recording a uh, water stream. I know it sounds crazy, he's recording water, but I was, I was outdoors and I decided to record the river pointing the mic at the river, then turn it back and record it with the back of the mic. And have a listen to the difference of, of you know, the top end loss. It's just absolutely drastic. And you see, with the top end, it's here. 
gone. Yeah, I believe this this illustrates well what I'm talking about here. And you know, this is this is an important feature that you should remember. Another thing that you should remember, that you should think about when when it comes to the top end, is that not all mics are symmetrical. And when it comes to figure of eight mics, you would expect that they will behave equally in both directions, but they don't. For example, the Royer uh, R121 is very famous with that, that if you put it uh, with the front, it sounds darker than if you point it with the back towards the source. Yeah. Uh, for example, the AEA um, R84, they've even given you the frequency response on the front and the back. Now, if this is not symmetrical and you're doing something like mid-side, this is something that you need to consider. You always want to pick a symmetrical microphone to do your mid-side recording techniques. Uh, another thing is, which I want to say, is that the low frequencies of polar patterns are never perfect. So, uh, and oh, uh, this is actually another thing. Uh, I should, you know, credit this guy. Um, I found it on the internet. It's one of these uh, things that you know, when people talk about, oh, in live sound, you know, dynamic mics uh, don't feedback so much. And it's the condensers this feedback. Well, what these guys are arguing here is that actually the diaphragm in a dynamic mic usually will be closer to the mouth of the singer. And for that reason, it will actually provide better rejection of the side um, signals, you know, everything that is around the mic. Uh, but but another thing that you can see here, if if I go back to the U87 uh, polar pattern, is uh, that even in cardioid, see this is my cardioid polar pattern, but these frequencies 500, 250, 125, uh, they're not cardioid. So actually, if you do an XY stereo recording with cardioid mics, your mids will be on point you have a very good recording in them, it's very good stereo image, but things will change in the high frequencies and the low end will get more and more of a mono. And that's a problem, yeah? And very briefly, there's just only just these two things and I'm done with that. I'm not going to go into stereo recording. Uh, this is from another presentation, AES presentation. This one I remembered to credit. It's by Helmut Vitek from Schöps. And I want to show you here the off-axis response of Mike. So this is the thing what I'm talking about. So. You know, this line on the top is how the mic sounds like from the front. The one at the very bottom, the red one, is how does it sound from behind? And this is the frequency response of a cardioid. So one thing to remember is that cardioid mics always have the most unnatural uh, frequency response at the back of the mic. Yeah, they usually sound like pretty horrendous. And you can see here that the low end's not so much rejected as what I was talking about before. Then there's this really crazy EQ curve and then the top end comes in. And so actually, this could be a problem if the spill that you rec you know, you're recording something, you're pointing the mic at that something, but the back of the mic is pointing at another instrument, that may not sound so good in cardioid. It will sound a lot better if you go to something like Omni, uh, Figure of Eight, even something like Hypercardioid, except that you also need to consider the proximity effect change here. Uh, but one thing to remember from all this is that when you're placing a microphone, you want to listen to the spill as well. So don't just listen to the sound that the microphone's giving to you from the source that you're recording, but also from the stuff that is around it and you don't want in your recording, yeah? Uh, and yeah, okay, there is more. I'm sure that, uh, you know, I could have structured this talk a little bit better and be a bit quicker, but I hope this was useful. I've got some other samples here. Uh, Maybe I can play something really cool. Uh, for example, oh yeah, one thing that I didn't speak about is these resonances. So in dynamic mics, usually these re resonances, because of the way the mics is designed, they fall sort of in the mid frequency range. Yeah, with um, omnidirectional condenser mics, these are usually at the very top end. So it's very common to see an omni mic with a boost in the top end, such as for example the Neumann Keim. Uh, 183, which is a very good, it's an excellent pencil mic, small diaphragm omni mic. A lot of people uh, take that mic and they put it up close to a guitar and it sounds thin because it has no proximity effect and it has this high frequency boost. But that mic is really, it excels when you put it far away. So again, knowing the mic and at what distance it's meant to be used is very important. Um, yeah. 
what else? What else? What else? So yeah, these resonances that I was talking about. So a ribbon mic has its resonance at the very low end. Yeah, we're talking about 20, 30, 40, 50 hertz, something like that. And so actually above that frequency, the response will be very smooth. And that's why the mid frequency range of ribbons is quite natural. Uh, dynamic mics have crazy resonances that, uh, you know, there's a very complex process of dampening. Well, very complex, I guess for me it's complex. <laughs> um, of dampening the diaphragm and trying to remove these resonances. Um, where, you know, condensers will have their... Mm, so usually large diaphragm, dual diaphragm mics would be somewhere a bit, a bit lower than single diaphragm omnidirectional mics. And dynamics is in the mid, ribbons is in the low end. And I believe this is one of the reasons why ribbons always have this low end bloom. They just sound lovely. Um, there's a good article on AES website as well about the impedance of the mic pre that you need to use. Uh, it's in the links. So maybe actually now is the moment for me to put some links up. Uh, and I don't know if there's any questions. I, I honestly don't even know if someone's watching this. Uh, let me put these links on the screen so that if somebody wants to check them out, you can see them. And I am uh, going to get some questions now. So I'm going to try to get online and see if anyone's listening to me. I see that there is one question already, uh, which was not so much related. Uh, okay, so for my CMP, there is another one. Uh, so the first one was what what's the mic that I'm using right now and I already told you it's Antelope Edge Duo uh, and I probably didn't show you this but it does come with two XLR three pin outputs so this is the duo output thing but on the other side it's a five pin XLR and that's why I can change the polar pattern and the model in 360 uh, and you can see probably that the logo of the mic is on this side yeah and I'm talking in the back of the mic because I've put it into cardioid pointing at the back of well, towards me and the back is not listening to the noise from my computer. Uh, there is another question I see here. Uh, what methods do you use if you don't use a gun? Uh, yeah, you can absolutely use um, a balloon. So neither a gunshot nor, um, nor a... A uh, balloon will be a perfect way to sample a space. Uh, same applies for loudspeaker. None of these is perfect. They're all imperfect. Uh, but balloons can actually give you very good results. You need to remember, though, that balloons will have resonances in the mid frequencies and they will not have much energy in the low and the high end. So what that means is that when you record the balloon, you will need to sort of do a smiley curve EQ boost on you know the bottom and the top end, but also... Uh, you will have an uneven mid-frequency response, which also needs to be compensated for with an EQ. And if you knew exactly where these resonances are, uh, you could actually predict it, you could do it. But the problem is that you will need the exact same balloon inflated in the same way. So balloons are good. What I would suggest is if you're using them, you could just drop them into like something like Space Design and it will work. Um, what I would suggest is that, that you heavily boost the bottom and the top end. The issue here is that usually this is where the most of the noise is, so you need to have a very good, very clean recording for this to work. Uh, let me now see if there's anything else on Facebook. Um, if there's any other questions in the stream. Actually, I don't know if there's someone still waiting uh, there and watching that. Uh, okay, six comments. Let's see if there's anything here. Uh, Polar patterns of the Edge Duo without the plugin. Okay, so there are some questions. Okay, so someone's asking here uh, if you can change the polar patterns of the Edge Duo without the plugin. Yes, you can. Uh, it's not very convenient, but you can because, okay, again, this is two cardio, it's point, pointing back to back. Yeah, and you have two outputs. So what you're recording with this is the cardio in this direction, the cardio in this direction. All you need to do is to put them onto two separate tracks in your DAW and then just blend them and it will work. I can show you that actually. So if we get back to one of these examples, 
uh, having Reaper, and maybe, let me see, I have something. So the one with the kick drum, right? So let's set that, let's set that to uh, card it here. Yeah, go edge do card it. And I'm going to add the same, exactly the same signal again in Cardit. So now what I'm doing is I'm summing the two signals in Cardit and it should sound like an Omni. So that's the two Cardits together. Now that's only one of them in Omni. It should be identical. Yeah. And if I flip the phase, okay, I'm, I'm not going to go now to load and load the phase EQ and all that, but if I flip the phase now of one of these and I do the same thing, I'll get a figure of eight. And then if I change the levels, I can get any other polar pattern um, and it will work. Okay, uh, let me see if there's any other questions. Uh, so... Another question, do you have uh, tips for MD441? Yeah, a very good mic, very expensive. Mm, what is that, seven, eight hundred quid for a dynamic mic? Um, I, I think it's mostly broadcast mic. Actually, I have to have a look at it. I believe that it also has, it's so long exactly to minimize the proximity effect. Uh, what do you mean tips? I mean, I, I like it on snare, I like it on drums, I like it on many things. Um, to be honest, I don't know. These days, I probably... I mean, I, I would still pick it up. I quite like it. Uh, but I, it might sound funny too, but recently, for, for drums, I've been using mostly condenser mics and ribbons. I haven't. I don't use that much dynamic mics. I sometimes pick them up for their specific sound. Um, what, what kind of tips do you mean? Like, what do you use it on? Uh, or is there any specific way to, to, to use the mic? I have to actually check it out. Um, I've used it quite a few times on snare. I can't remember. I think that it's a mic that is designed to be used at a close distance. So that would be a tip. You know, you probably uh, will lose some low end if you're quite far from the source. And uh, it will sound quite natural if you're close enough. Uh, but if that's not exactly what you were asking... Uh, okay, let me see if there's anything else. So I don't see anything else on Facebook. Let's see if there's anything on YouTube. And if not, then I'm going to call it a day. Um, no Russian subtitles. I'm really sorry uh, about that. Does antelope, uh, antelope modeling mics uh, does reproduce distant characteristics or only EQ? Yeah, okay, so it's not going to be absolutely perfect um, modeling. Like, in fact, I would argue that um, with the current technology that we have, it's impossible to fully... Uh, uh, emulate that. So what's going to happen is the mic itself will have its own proximity effect and then you will be applying a uh, specific equalization that would take into account the also the off-axis response. So this is why you have two outputs, yeah, in order to model that better. But is it going to be just like that in the original mics? Nah, you, you will never get exactly the same sound. And, and this is something that I want to say about these mics. I use them a lot. To me, they sound fantastic. Um, I, they don't sound exactly like the models that you model, but that's not the point of it. The point is that you have another tool that can give you uh, flexibility. I mean, imagine like, okay, I, I just spent nearly two hours speaking about all these technical, super geeky aspects of microphones. You're never going to get into this in a real world session, right? I mean, you, if you knew that and you have this experience and you're able to pick the right mic because you already have this knowledge, uh, that's great, but usually you'll be quite in a rush. You'll have a second to pick the mic, put it there, and get on with the session. So actually, what I really like about the modeling mics is that you can just put it there, and then when you need a different mic for the verse, for the chorus, for the BVs, for whatever, for a different singer, you get a male, female singer, you get a soprano or a tenor, whatever, you just flip the mic model. And does it give you exactly the original mic? Well but it gives you something very similar to that. Uh, I was actually, let me, 
I've played a lot of samples, but there's nothing like the sound of a ribbon on uh, on guitar. So I'm gonna play that very briefly. Uh, here's some heavy guitars, and I just want to show you uh, how the sound changes. It's it's really cool, actually. I really like that. So the edge duo in Omni, and then I'll flip the, the polar pattern first. Oops. No, that's the drum room mic. Sorry, my bad. Uh, room guitar, this one. Yeah. So that's just the guitar uh, room mic. Okay, I think it might be a bit glitchy. I apologize for that. It's Uh, not sure why this is happening, but let's try from that to this. Okay, this is, I don't know, it's starting to glitch, so perhaps this is telling me it's time for you to go. You've been here for two hours, that's uh, too much. Uh, so just checking if there's anything else, but I believe this is it. Uh, yep. I don't see any other questions, so I apologize if I've missed something. I hope this was useful. My intention was actually to be a bit less, um, a bit less technical and to play more of the samples. But yeah, I guess I'm just used to talk for a very long time, and uh, perhaps this talk was a bit longer than it should have been. Um, thank you so much for being with me, and again, I hope it was useful. And yeah, uh, please, uh, if you're interested in knowing more about the vocal sounds of uh, Bjork and uh, Grace Jones and Annie Lennox and Sia and Uncle and, and many others, uh, join me this Friday on Antelope's channels for another live stream with uh, Cameron Craig. And that's it for me. Thank you very much. Goodbye.